Why did it take you so long to find out you're autistic? Why didn't anyone spot it years ago? When adults finally learn that we're autistic, it's often the first thing we ask. We read through the diagnostic report and it all seems so obvious. So why didn't someone just tell us? Things could have been so different. I'm Quinn and I'm autistic. And today on Autistomatic, we're asking, why didn't anyone notice you were autistic before? If you don't know me already, I'm Quinn, and I've known I'm autistic for 40 years. When I received my diagnosis, the world had barely even heard of autism, and the spectrum was still a promising but untested theory. It was simply impossible for an ordinary person like you or me to self-identify back then. Until about a decade ago, most of the autistic people I met were younger than me. Not everyone, but the majority by some measure. But since then, the autistic demographic has changed massively. The reasons behind that shift are no mystery, though. The autism spectrum wasn't formalised in print by the World Health Organisation until 1992. And two years later, it was adopted in America too. The very first autism spectrum diagnosis based on DSM criteria in the United States was only 30 years ago. Since then, the most likely path to receiving an autism diagnosis has always been found within our education systems, which kind of makes sense, really. Much of what autistic people find most disabling and other people see as frustrating about us centre around social interaction and communication. For many of us, school is our first introduction to mixing with large groups of strangers and of strict rules-based hierarchy. So it's not just possible, but likely that autistic kids might start to show signs of stress in school that weren't noticed before. If you left the school system before the autism spectrum went mainstream, then your chances of being spotted as possibly autistic were vanishingly small. Yes, there were test cases along the way like myself, so-called troublemakers and misfits who received preliminary diagnoses in the 80s from practitioners with their eyes on the future. Those Provisional statements built the foundation of proof for the adoption of the spectrum later on. But nobody actually knows how many of us there were in that decade or so from initial paper to worldwide formal recognition. It was only in the thousands at most, unlike the millions of us we know about today. Back when the spectrum was adopted by the WHO in 1992, the minimum school leaving age in the UK was 16. And staying on to further education wasn't as common as it would become later. If you were born before 1976, that's people currently about 48 years or older, you had no realistic chance of receiving an autism diagnosis in your school days. 48 years old. How many teenagers and young adults watching this now have parents that age? And older folks, of course. We're talking about plenty of grandparents and great-grandparents here now too. The main reason someone might have slipped through the net might just be their age. Anyone over 40, and especially those of us over 50, had such a low chance of being diagnosed with a condition that nobody had heard of or was really new at the time, that age definitely played a part in why we weren't identified as autistic sooner. There's been a huge increase in autistic people in my age group, Gen Xers and our baby boomer parents. But what about all the undiagnosed millennials coming to light now? What about all those in their 20s, 30s and early 40s who are finding out they're autistic? What else should we be looking at? When I first heard the word autism, I was maybe seven or eight years old. It was a piece on children's TV and about an American savant boy described as a human calculator. That was all I heard of autism until I was told I was autistic myself a few years later. But for millennials, things were a bit different, and the turning point, from my perspective, has always been in plain sight. 
The worldwide success of the movie Rain Man in 1989 turned autism from a little-known obscure condition few people had heard of into a global talking point. When the autism spectrum hit the diagnostic manuals a couple of years later, autism yet again became a hot topic of conversation. Not very informed conversation, though. For salty old autistic dogs like me, our introductions to new people went from spelling out the word autism and explaining the basics to battling a rising tide of unhelpful ideas and scary misconceptions about who and what we are. This was the era that saw the rise of Autism Speaks, Andrew Wakefield's destructive nonsense about vaccines and plenty of reductive theories that set the stage for many of the struggles we wrestle with now. We went from nobody knowing autism existed to a planet full of armchair experts. You know how, during big sporting tournaments, you see all these folks who showed no interest in the game before suddenly coming out of the woodwork like they know it all? They've not paid the slightest notice before, but as soon as the national team's doing well, they're all over it like a rash. That's kind of what it felt like, and still does to some extent. It has got better, don't get me wrong, but the biggest barrier to being identified as autistic is people simply not knowing what autism looks like. Even now, public understanding of autism and even neurodiversity is a long way behind the curve. Before 1992, there was no autism spectrum, at least not on paper, and it took a decade or so for the message to filter through to ground level, to parents, teachers, GPs, health visitors, social workers, and all the other experts and key personnel you'd expect to be on the ball about something like this. This was a monumental shift in establishment thinking that took a long time to permeate down through the layers of bureaucracy, best practice, staff training, budget restrictions and individual apathy to start having a significant impact and it's a process that continues today. When the diagnostic manuals incorporated the autism spectrum, they also introduced the new diagnosis of Asperger's syndrome. A few years later, when the next editions came out, it was gone superseded and no longer to be diagnosed. We're still living with the confusion that caused and the internet arguments it fuels to this day. In the 40 years since I was diagnosed, when refrigerator mothers were still being seriously discussed, we've seen numerous theories come and go. Amongst those to fall from being the dog's danglies down to dog dirt are hypermasculinity and empathic deficit. And that's just from one prominent, respected name in the field, let alone the cranks. We've also seen a huge rise in autistic people seeking to understand ourselves from within. Not only enthusiastic amateurs like me, but people who've dedicated their academic careers to working these things out scientifically and provably. It does seem like every time we point out how things look different to us than they do to our often critical non-autistic observers that we confuse and sometimes enrage them further. Every move towards clarity for us seems to muddy the waters for everyone else, and so the lack of clarity persists. Number two, then, on our list of why-weren't-you-spotted candidates is good old-fashioned ignorance. I sometimes surprise people when I say that there was no toxicity about autism until people knew what it was. That didn't mean autistic people weren't having a bloody hard time all over the world, though, and perhaps that's where some of the surprise comes from. It's difficult to imagine a time when the word autistic didn't carry some unwanted, unpleasant baggage with it, but there was a short window of blissful innocence after I got my diagnosis, when I could say, autism or autistic and receive nothing but blank looks. That changed very quickly after Rain Man hit the screens. They say a little knowledge is a dangerous thing, and in my world there's little better illustration of that than the way public attitudes about autism appeared out of nowhere in the early 90s and then seemed to get stuck in a loop for 30 years. The third of the big reasons behind why someone might get to adulthood without knowing they're autistic is, in a weird way, kindness. But it's a kindness born of stigma. 
I've told the tale many times of how I stopped telling people I was autistic after Rain Man came out. It was common knowledge even then that the autistic character in the movie was based on someone who wasn't actually autistic themselves, but bitter experience taught me that nobody's really interested in that little nugget of cinema trivia. A couple of weeks ago, a commentator on my Is Your Best Friend Autistic video talked of how they and their best friend used to call each other autistic as a tease. A bantery insult. They both believed themselves to be neurotypical at the time, but now at least one of them is knowingly actually autistic, possibly both of them. Their attitudes and understanding have obviously changed since then, but just take a moment to think about that. Autistic people using the word autistic as a slur before later finding out they're autistic themselves. It's not the only time I've heard such a tale either. Some of us had a very poor, sometimes quite disturbing view of autistic people before we knew we were in the neurodivergent club ourselves. Recently, we've seen the media and the general public persistently trying to link autism with the ills of society. Every senseless murder and mass shooting sees the papers speculating about autism before they even know the killer's identity. Celebrities and politicians make headlines by linking us with everything from sexual deviance to violence against women, then painting us as innocent, impressionable victims of evil agendas when it suits their purposes. The general public still don't know what to do with autism, and so they often just take the path of least resistance and minimal effort. They just listen to what the media tells them, to what their favourite celebrities think, to the news, to bloggers and sometimes to YouTubers like me. But they also listen to Mickey down the pub, Maureen in the hair salon and Mrs McCluskey, the head teacher. All of them have their own input and opinions and people are rarely kind about us as a demographic. The general public's perception of what it means to be autistic is not a positive one, and that's why not diagnosing us or telling us is seen as a kindness. They don't want to saddle us with the consequences of the ignorance we've been talking about and the stink of an unwanted diagnosis that may see us judged unfairly. Historically, we're not just talking about borderline cases either. I know people who barely spoke as kids and had frequent explosive meltdowns who were bypassed for diagnosis because a practitioner or sometimes a parent decided that an autism diagnosis was a cross they didn't want them to bear. One can understand the reasoning and perhaps forgive their motives, but we also know how what they did just perpetuates the same stigma it seeks to avoid. The only way I can see to make our lives easier in the long run is to fix the very issues we've talked about today. There may be a better chance of identification today, better public knowledge and less of a stigma than a few years ago for some of us, but plenty of autists still slip through the net. There's other factors at play, of course, like individual masking, co-occurring conditions and the like, but Those are personal attributes or learned skills that vary from person to person. Every autist who wasn't identified until adulthood can look to at least one of these three factors as being a big contributor. We can't turn back time, so there's nothing we can do about number one on the list. But the other two, ignorance and stigma, are within our grasp. And the main thing it takes is exercising that very autistic trait of talking about ourselves. Not everyone is best placed to get the message across, we know that, but those of us who are good communicators or whose social masking skills give us opportunities to be listened to can make a difference. We already are. Thanks to this channel, I've been privileged to talk directly to researchers and practising psychologists and psychiatrists to help them shape the future of autism discourse and diagnosis. Numerous other creators and thinkers have done the same, even collaborating on or writing research papers of their own. All the blogs, the vlogs, the podcasts and epic social media threads my colleagues in advocacy write reach someone new every time. But most of us have an impact, even if we don't realise, on the ground level. It's that 
ground level, grassroots interaction that matters most because it's ordinary people who actually make the difference in our daily lives. Once all the Mickeys, the Maureens and the Mrs McCluskeys know what autism really is and that it's nothing to be scared of, the ignorance and the stigma that's blighted our lives will fade away. When that happens, no autist will go unnoticed again. I'm Quinn and I'm autistic. Thank you for watching. If you've already liked and subscribed and would like to support the channel more, then please follow the Patreon links in the description to pledge what you feel is fair and affordable to help keep the lights on here and the content keep flowing.